Welcome back again to Checks to Unconditional Covenants. This is number six in the series where we are looking at check marks supporting conditional covenants. We're examining the scriptures, looking into the scriptures, the word of God, concerning a common held belief that the covenants, particularly the new covenant, is completely unconditional. There's nothing new in this discussion or this interest in this subject. It's been stretching back uh, to the days of uh, the Reformation and would have been existing in the church even before then, from the very start, in the first few hundred years. You ought to note that doctrine has always been hotly contested, even in the New Testament. There have always been heresies, there have always been false teachers and there's always been the truth and there's always been true doctrine. It is the joy and the blessing of Christians to search the scriptures to see what it is that God has said and is saying. So welcome to number six in the series. If you've been following along, you have a foundation to work on from where we are now. Sound doctrine ought to endure right throughout time and the passage of time and needs to endure until Jesus comes back. Once the Lord from glory returns, well, doctrine won't matter as such because it won't be a matter of choosing what you believe. In the first session, we saw that there would come a time when Christians would not endure sound doctrine. This is the scripture. There's no doubt about the fact that grace is what saves lost mankind, the grace of God, the goodness of God. Without grace, not a single person could be saved. It is a, an awesome thought, even a terrifying thought, to believe that God is good. Because if he's good, then he can't associate with evil, with bad and with wrong. And, and we people, we are certainly do wrong and are evil. We even do wrong when we don't want to do wrong. So praise God that God in his grace looks beyond his goodness, his justice, to find a way in which he can rightly and justly display mercy. So without grace, not a single person could be saved, could have peace in their conscience and their heart, could know God. The grace of God is the complete plan of redemption, secured for all mankind by God's only begotten Son, Jesus. This is the message of the Bible. God reaching out in love to make a way of peace that does not in any way diminish his holiness or his righteousness or his justice. In this session, we're looking at the truth of the concept that grace is not for granted. 
that you mustn't take grace for granted. This point cannot be missed. Christians are sons of God, but they do not hold the position in heaven that Jesus does. Now, Jesus can't sin. Jesus can't displease God now. Jesus is in heaven. He's passed through death unto life. There is no possibility of him sinning or disobeying. Praise his mighty blessed name. He was born of a virgin, became a man, and with that becoming the second Lord from heaven, the second man from heaven, the Lord from heaven who is born a man. He could at any point please or displease God. Praise God, he always pleased God, his Father. He did not sin. He was without sin. But he could have sinned. He, he, it, the capacity was there. That's what allows him to be our great high priest, because there's no doubt about it that he became a man. But we Christians... We're the sons of God, but we do not hold the position in heaven that Jesus does. We might be seated at the right hand uh, of God in heaven, but we're not actually in heaven yet. The message is, do not take God's grace for granted. And the Bible warns Christians not to take the grace of God for granted. We're going to look at a few scriptures that, that show definitely that Christians can take the grace of God for granted. And this session will look at the folly of taking God's grace for granted and the scriptural warnings concerning grieving the Holy Spirit and doing just that. If there was no danger in taking God's grace for granted, uh, then the Bible wouldn't give us warnings and penalties concerning taking God's grace for granted. In other words, assuming that God's grace will keep us from falling, regardless of our behavior, belief, or attitude. Here's some clear scriptural evidence. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Now one of the great conflicts that you're going to come at when you start to study the Word of God and become uh, somebody who is intensely keen on what God says, is that amongst the varying doctrines that you find abroad today is who are the we in this book of Hebrews? If you believe like I do that the we means all born-again Christians regardless of whether they are of Jewish descent or not, then this verse is towards us. If you believe like some do that the, the word of God is divided into dispensational areas of time and therefore different meanings to different groups at different times, then you might be led to believe that the we in this passage means the writer of the passage and the people that he was speaking to were his fellow Jews, descendants of Abraham of the flesh. And that this book is really a fifth gospel written to the Jews.
actually, I suppose I'm quite passionate about this because this is the first time in my life when I uh, had to learn how to disagree with the spiritual authority who put forward the notion to the church that Hebrews was merely a fifth gospel to the Jews. And I had to learn how to contend with him and entreat him in such a manner to show that, no, Hebrews is as much to the born-again, spirit-filled Gentile Christian as to any Christian. One of the most compelling arguments is that Paul, which I believe wrote this epistle, but you may not, but whoever wrote the epistle, he uses the term holy brethren. You know, they, they were definitely born again. And it's a very inclusive passages of scripture. Not exclusive to a certain time or a certain race of people. I believe that God's made of one blood all nations and that Jesus Christ is the saviour of the whole world and that the way to uh, acceptance with God, whether you be Jew or Gentile or wherever you come from, is exactly the same. Christ is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, regardless of their sex and regardless of their race, heritage, culture, nationality, skin color, pedigree, uh, DNA component or whatever Christ is the light that lights everybody that comes into the world so if we say that how shall we escape meaning the church meaning Gentile and Jewish Christians anybody who's born again how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation or so great salvation confirmed unto us that heard him. Us. He's talking about the uh, the first believers in Jesus. But Jesus made it perfectly clear, perfectly clear, that it was not be confined to descendants of Abraham in the Jewish race. In fact, he goes so far as to say that when the church was would be endured from on high with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it would be to Samaria, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And if you look in the book of Acts, the apostles were sent round to all the uh, newcomers, as in groups, into the church so that they could see that the church was indeed one body. So you find them turning up when, when Gentiles are saved and, and uh, when Samaritans are saved. You see the same witness, the same salvation, the same body, no schism in it, one people in Christ, regardless of our nationality or our birth, natural birth, uh, heritage and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 therefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall now this is this is a letter definitely written to a uh, a church in the heart of the Greek culture there would have been converted Jews and converted Greeks or Gentiles in this church. They're told to have no schism. And uh, the scripture admonishes us and says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. What is the point of such an admonition if indeed uh, a person who is truly saved and serving God is incapable of falling. 
there is clear scriptural evidence that the covenant, particularly the second covenant, the covenant that we are in, is conditional. The messages do not abuse God's grace. The Bible repeatedly warns Christians the danger of abusing God's grace. If God did not spare Israel, his chosen people, when they rebelled against him, he will hardly spare backsliders who rebel against the Lord and do the same thing. It's not enough to say they were never saved in the first place. You can't find a single scripture to give you that evidence. When you look in the scriptures at the people who turned their back on the Lord and went back into the world, it is ludicrous to suggest that either they were never saved in the first place or in actual fact, somehow or other, God maintains his covenant with him with them in spite of their behaviour. There is clear scriptural reasoning. Romans chapter 11 verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. God dealt with the rebellion of the Israelites in a very harsh manner, and they lost out. God deals with the rebellion of the saint, of the believer, in a firm and consistent manner. And you can, <laughs> you know, be not spared. You can be a branch in the vine, and you can be not spared under certain circumstances. What does the term take heed lest he spare not thee mean if grace is unconditional? Let's look at an Old Testament principle. I've heard it put forward that, that the election of God is so secure. Mind you, you should understand what it is that God has chosen. He hasn't chosen individual people. He's chosen the way of salvation. Always amazes me. So let's look at uh, this Old Testament example because people say, well, it, you know, God really does uh, save uh, absolutely without any will or action on the behalf of the believer and that if God has elected someone to be saved, nothing that they do can help that salvation and nothing that they do can hinder that salvation. Even to the point that if a, an elected person was so intent on doing evil and that God saw that they were going to continue to do evil that he would actually end their life in order to preserve them. Really. In the Old Testament, a son that was incurably stubborn and rebellious was stoned to death. <laughs> it wasn't to save him. It was to save uh, the rest of the people he was made an example of so others would fear. Now, while we're not in the Old Testament, now we do have more light, and of course with more light comes accountability. To suggest that God forcibly brings a rebellious person's life to an end before they can lose their state of salvation is really stretching a point. Life was brought to an end in the Old Testament as a punishment, not as a measure of salvation. 
It was an example to the living and those that remain. This is the account of parents with a rebellious son. And yes, it's extreme and, and it demonstrates the case, though. You find it in Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21. Let's just read it. If a man hath a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This is our son, he is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard, and all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. <coughs> There's no doubt that parents love their children. The question to ask, does death save us? Does God kill us to preserve the state of grace? When loving parents had done all that they could, to correct their son after they had chastened him many times and notice it says the father and the mother not just the father Deuteronomy 21 18 says if a man hath a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them Now, I've been preaching for 50 years. One thing that I noticed about uh, many uh, of my fellow preachers when they were younger and uh, their families were young, they tended to preach and believe that uh, God chastened and disciplined his children and that uh, evil and stubborn wrongdoing that was accompanied with a refusal to repent meant not that they were physically stoned, but that they were put out of the church, excommunicated, even put out of the family until they changed their ways. certainly wouldn't tolerate behavior in the household. But as they became older, and uh, we end up with children that may not believe uh, and in actual fact rebel, then our love and desire as a parent starts to change the focus. Because nobody wants their flesh and blood lost in our case with the rebellious son in the Old Testament if he was still refused to be corrected God commanded that the parents drag him to the gate of the city where he was stoned to death now, these heartbroken parents did not do this to keep their son from falling from grace. They did it because he'd gone too far. And the question is, can a person in the new covenant go too far? The evidence of the scriptures is definitely, yes, they can. If you're going to suggest that they can't go too far, then you have to rest the scriptures and do all sorts of manipulations with the teaching and the doctrine to make it fit. Romans 
real children are chastened. This is the message of the scriptures. In fact, uh, <laughs> one of the first scripture verses that I learned off by heart was that endure the chastening of the Lord, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. <laughs> He's going to correct you. The same principle concerning God's children is given in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews 12 verse 7. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Of course, the answer to this is obvious, except in today's uh, culture, fathers don't really chasten their children. We have uh, sacrificed Charles chastening on the advice that we need to build up self-esteem. Where did that advice, advice come from? It certainly didn't come out of the Word of God. It came from modern thought. If a backslider responds to God's loving chastenment, he's restored to fellowship. If he doesn't, Well, he's not. I had a preacher friend who used to quaintly say when he was in a backsidden state, and I mean obviously a backsidden state, living in the world, of the world, by the world, you know, involved in, in uh, uh, sins of the flesh, uh, drunkenness and the like. He used to use the quaint phrase that he was out of fellowship with the Father trying to mean that somehow he was just out of fellowship with the Father. He wasn't really lost. You have to wonder sometimes. When somebody proves to be incurably rebellious... He is rejected. To reject it means to be put out. Hebrews chapter 12, 17. For you know that how afterwards, when he would have inherited a blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. His repentance wasn't a real repentance, wasn't godly repentance. It's it's godly sorrow works repentance. If you if you've got a worldly style sorrow, you're sorrow sorry because you're missing out, or you're sorry because you know some personal reason you haven't got the outing, or you've lost the treat, or you've lost the reward. If that's the motivation of your sorrow, it's not a lot enough. It's godly sorrow that works repentance. Look what happens to the evil servant. The fact is, he is a servant, but he behaves in an evil manner, and he gets cast into hell. Matthew 24, 48-51 But, and if, that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord dislayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour when he is not aware, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. First of all, notice that this servant was a servant of the Lord, truly. Now I know, I know. See, when I was first saved, I believe that the Word of God was the Word of God, all of it. It didn't matter to me who Matthew was. I didn't read any notes at the beginning of the book of Matthew telling me that this, this man only wrote to the Jews. He didn't. He wrote the Word of God. He wrote to anybody who would read it, hungering after righteousness. 
So to say that the kingdom of heaven parables and the kingdom of God parables are, are not the same or don't apply to the same people is, a, is really quite nonsensical. I mean, there's even a verse that includes a term kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God in the same verse. So now we have an evil servant serving the Lord, of course, but evil. And what happens to him? He doesn't repent. He behaves in a shocking manner and he gets put out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He ends up in hell. How can a person end up in hell if the covenant is completely unconditional? Here's another point. You can actually sell your birthright. What is your birthright? Christ purchased a birthright for you on Calvary. He bore the sin of every man, woman and child. So that everybody is born, you know, he's the light that lights everyone that enters into the world. We all start off and then we start sinning and we all commit our own sin. When we come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through faith and repentance in him, through his death and resurrection, we become born again. And being born again is our birthright. Now just look at this. Esau sold his earthly birthright. It is possible for Christians to sell their heavenly birthright. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Connected to Hebrews chapter 12, 15 to 16. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, troubling you, and whereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You can sell your birthright. I mean, that, what could be clearer than that? A root of bitterness. Fail of the grace of God. How can you fail of the grace of God? If the grace of God can't, it is inevitable unconditional a root of bitterness cannot spring up in your heart without you becoming defiled and any fornicator or profane person who continues in that won't accept the chastening of the Lord will not return with true godly sorrow and repentance is going to sell their birthright, just like Esau did. And being sorry because you're missing out on some rewards won't cut the mustard. You have to have godly sorrow with repentance. Security in Christ or those who base uh, their security in the Lord Jesus Christ, living faithfully to him, following and obeying him, are completely secure. Praise the Lord. Backsliders who believe the Lord will tolerate rebellion and will wink at sin because they have been sa saved under an unconditional covenant are sailing under a false sense of security. <laughs> and I believe are in very dangerous waters. And even more so if they teach others to do the same. Can you sin against grace? Well, let's look at some of the sins that are listed that are against the grace of God. So these scriptures would be meaningless if grace 
is absolutely secured regardless of our beliefs or our behavior. But there's a few of them, and they do mean something. Let's look at them. Receive the grace of God in vain, 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Obviously, and this is a Gentiles, by the way, not just Hebrew Jews. Obviously, you can receive the grace of God in vain. What does the word receive mean? It means to receive, to believe in, to walk in, to enjoy, to have the comfort of, the benefit of. You can receive it in vain. You can frustrate the grace of God. You can stop it working. You can hinder it in its outworking. Galatians 2.21 I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness came by the law then Christ is dead in vain. If Christ is dead in vain there is no salvation. So frustrating the grace of God means that you're moving into a state of not being saved. fail of grace Hebrews 12 15 looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you thereby many be many be defiled we read this earlier but the point is you've got to look diligently because it is possible any man any one of us could fail of the grace of God how do we do that well <laughs> we let a root of bitterness spring up. We return to fornication and adultery. We wallow in drunkenness. We can be defiled. In fact, many were defiled. I say, make sure you're not one of them. Fall from grace. Galatians 5.1 once again, these are Gentile Christians. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. To fall from something, you have to be in it. They were in grace. Now Christ becomes of no effect to you. So you cease to be saved. You go back to the law... We're not talking about the law of liberty here. We're not talking about the law that has never changed. We're talking about the ceremonial law and add-ons that Moses was given. The shadow, if you like. Go back to that, out of the fullness of the light of Christ. You fall from grace. Grace is no longer effective in your life, and without grace it's impossible to be saved. despise grace Hebrews 10 29 oh how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and had done despite unto the spirit of grace Look at this, the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. He was definitely saved. The person people described here were born again. They were saved, separated. They now turn around and they count it an unholy thing. And they do despite to the grace of God. And there is a sore punishment. thought worthy 
There's a judgment coming. We're all going to be at it. And incidentally, faith and hope don't make it to that judgment, so they can't stand as a witness. What stands as a witness is the fruit of Christ in your life, the works that he's wrought in you. along with your agreement and willingness. Turn grace into lust. Jude 1.4 For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You can turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, into lust. It'll do you no good if you do. Such people need to be withstood. These scriptures are the record. The scriptures above apply to the grace of God. Whether this is directed at false teachers or not, it applies to anyone saved or unsaved who try to use God's grace to cover for sin. You can't cover sin by the grace of God. God does not look down on your sinful behavior through the blood of his Son and see you holy unless you have godly sorrow faith in him and turn and repent and ask for forgiveness Christians are not prevented from returning to their former state returning to the world returning back into sin to constantly claim that a Christian cannot commit these sins or to say that God will not allow a saved person to backslide so far as to totally fall away is a stubborn refusal to believe the simple and clear language of the Word of God. It's not enough to hide behind some type of idea that, well, if you're born, you can't be unborn. Oh, I thought Nicodemus had that problem. He thought that if you were born, you couldn't be born a second time. Not a very sound argument. You can have your name blotted out of the book of life. And yes, it was in there. And it can be removed. The admonition of the scripture is to make sure that it isn't removed. Hallelujah. <laughs> The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Why be concerned about judgment? If the state of grace is permanent, why be concerned with, for instance, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, 31 to 32? For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. There is a possibility that a born-again, spirit-filled believer can be condemned with the world. If there isn't that possibility, then this verse is nonsense. And why bother judging yourself? And why bother judging anybody else? If you love somebody, you're going to seek their best. I've been thinking a lot about, you know, uh, the first reply when God said, what about your brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? Well, we are. 
and learning how to keep our brother is, of course, the challenge. Do we nurture them or do we admonish them? And how do we tell the difference? Because we want to the best for one another. We don't want anybody lost. Condemn with the world. What do you think that means? Just what do you think being condemned with the world actually means? Paul uses the term we. That is to say, those who have received the grace and the mercy of God through faith. Those whose salvation is secure, but could be condemned with the world. It's a possibility. And it's not God's choosing, it's God's righteousness. So consider the consequences. Surely this will need to be considered. Unfortunately, there are a lot of scriptures grossly misinterpreted simply because people do not understand the context of the English that's used. What makes you think, if you can't understand the context of the English, that delving into root meanings in a foreign language for those words are going to really clarify the matter? Righteousness is a mystery. Unrighteousness is a mystery. The kingdom of God is a mystery. The word of God does not contradict itself and if it appears to do so, it's because we don't understand the real meaning. Our perceptions of what its meaning is has become flawed. And that's why Paul warns against the folly of fables. Mixing the truth of the word of God with what are really the thoughts and ideas and pro mental processes and thinking of mankind. The record of the scriptures, the new covenant and the grace of God is conditional. At any given moment, we are either pleasing or displeasing God. The consequences of unrepentant sin always remain the same, whether you're saved or you're unsaved. And next time and next session, we'll continue this looking at the implications of this situation. God bless you and keep you, keep rejoicing. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. As you're soft to him, you'll always overcome. Praise the Lord, there is no temptation that can overtake us, that can actually sweep us away, because God is faithful and good. Desire righteousness, love holiness, trust Jesus, and keep a soft and humble heart before him. God bless you and keep you. Amen. Cheers for now, Dan.